So Seven Wonders, one of the uh, games we picked, we played like, I don't know, a ton of games that we have to review. We've just been slowly like yep. piling them up and then playing them more yeah. times to make sure. Basically, Seven Wonders is the new hot game. I heard about it and I heard that it was the new hot game. I played it a couple times at someone's house and then I played it a few more times at like uh, Zenkai Con and then Rim bought a copy and we played it even more. Yep, it was sold out. I had to pre-order Obviously, it you know already. On Amazon. Yeah, you know already that if we played it so much and we kept going back to it, that it was good. A warning. <laughs> I am getting slightly tired of it, and I don't think it has staying power. I agree. Yep, well, there we go. <laughs> but anyway, it's still a great game. I highly recommend you own it because straight up, this is a game like Zularetto where it's not the best game. If you're smart, you'll have solved it pretty quickly. And the winner will come down to luck. But it's a game that you can whip out and play relatively quickly, that you can teach relatively quickly. It's a great game, like, at a con, like, you have a bunch of new people. We should play a game. You don't really want to spend 45 game is, minutes teaching them Puerto Rico. The game pretty much is almost exactly in the same niche as Ticket to Ride. It takes about the same length of time to play. It's got that same mechanic of, on your turn, all you do is one very small thing, and you take a lot of small turns, so the game goes very quickly. And, in fact, this is even one better than Ticket to Ride because everyone takes simultaneous turns. So there's absolutely no waiting for anyone to take their turn. You just keep going and going and going and going and it going also and, and the game's over. It also prevents any arguments of, oh, so-and-so always doesn't take his turn. That's a lie. You take just as long because you can see every round exactly who's holding everyone up. Because everyone's taking their turn simultaneously. It's so. always Scott Johnson. That's right. <laughs> so the way Seven Wonders works is... You know, uh, you have there's a deck of cards, and you split it up, and you give everyone a hand. And on your turn, every turn of the entire game, all you do is play a card. That's it. And you and then you give the the remaining cards to the person to your left or right, depending whatever. And some of the cards are resources, and you basically tap the resources magic style every round. So you build up this kind of increasing accumulation of resources, and there's a whole bunch of different kinds. Yeah. So you so early in the game, you build up more resources, and having more resources allows you to play other cards, which allow you to play other cards which allow you to play more cards that give you more points and then at the end of the game where I was the most points wins right so it's all about you know getting a good sequence of cards that play into each other you know every t if you play a card and, and you never use that card and it never gets you any points you just wasted a turn because you could have used that card to get money instead which would be worth at least one point now it has a lot of particular mechanics that are either cribbed from other games or just analogously grown. Like, you build buildings, right? And you can only build unique buildings. So if there's a granary and you build it, you can't build another granary. But you can build another building similar to a granary. Yes. Now, the thing is, many buildings have a notation on them that if you already have X building, you can build this for free. Yep. It's basically identical to the way it works in Attica. Yeah, for example, I learned uh, by, you know, if you if you actually look at the cards of the game, right, I learned that there's a very, the most difficult card to build in the whole game is worth like eight points. I forget what it is. Uh, it might be the Parthenon or something. It's something ridiculous. It's worth a ton of points. But if you have a theater, you can build that ridiculously expensive building for free. So basically, I always build the theater so that I can always try to get the expensive building for free and it's worked out in my favor two or three times already yep <laughs> so it's like knowing once you know the cards the game starts to lose a lot of its luster because it's like to sort of obvious the path to take uh well i wouldn't say the path there are i don't know about three maybe four paths to victory yeah, through the game. There's the military path. Yeah. There's the green path. Well, military is a choice that modifies every path. It, that's true. Because uh, military alone does not win you the game. That can true. get you at most 10 plus 6 plus 2 points. But yeah, it's mostly the green path and the blue path are the way, ways to go, right? And green is harder to do, but has a potentially higher payout. Like, if one guy goes all blue and one guy goes all green, green guy is probably going to win because the way the math works. But here, let's talk about, like, the reason the paths are different. You know, not to get into the stupid details of the game, because you should just buy it. You'll read the rules. You'll see how it really works. But the green path is these... There's a sets of different types cards. of items. Yeah, science cards. So there's three types, and you get points increasingly based on the number of sets of three that you get, but also two to the N points, N being the number of one particular one that you have. So basically all the green cards, if you start piling them up, they it makes sort of like a two-dimensional grid of scoring. So all the green cards actually score twice in two different ways. And, what it, this and, means, and one of those ways it scores, it scores exponentially. And the other way it scores, it scores linearly, but even the linear scoring is a multiple of seven. Yep. 
Yep. So you get basically every green card. As you get more of them, they the, the amount of points that each individual green card gives you continues to go up at a very, very high rate. So if you're playing this game, because the, you know, with two-dimensional grid, it's actually fairly complicated until you figure it out and then it's obvious. If you play this game with friends who have not played it before... Get all the green cards. They will look at the green cards, They'll glaze their eyes will glaze over when you explain how the scoring works, and they'll ignore them. You will win almost every time if you go for the green cards when people around you are not that bright or haven't played much. Yeah, it is sort of interesting because there isn't a lot of interplayer... You know, there is a little bit, right? You can buy things from the people to your left or right, and you military with the people to your left or right, and things like that. And uh, but It you- has a heavy left-right mechanic. Yes, and you know, there's in you hand. You think about your hand. You're you're gonna play a card, but any cards you leave in your hand, you're giving to the person to your left or your right, depending on the the age. So there is, you know, significant impact you can have on your immediate neighbors in the game. And in a three player game, that's really significant because you're influencing all the other players. But other than that, there isn't a whole lot of interplayer, you know, mechanics. Right? You can't destroy other people's cards. You can't steal their cards. You can't. There's really not much you can do to, to take points away from other people It's about directly. the same. It's a little more than, say, Agricola in terms of how much you can actually yeah. fuck with I everybody. I say it's a little bit less than Puerto Rico because you can screw with people sort of the same way that you do in Puerto Rico. Like, aha, I played captain, so you couldn't play captain. You know, but it's like a little bit less than that because in Puerto Rico, if I craftsman out from under you, that could hurt you pretty badly, you know. So uh, my main problem with the game is that like I said, I think I have solved it mostly, and I think when I play, it really just comes down to luck. Yeah. And it didn't. It took maybe eight plays to solve. There's not that much going on in Most the game. Most people, though, don't play a game as much as we do, right? They get a game, and if they play it twice, it's like, oh, they're so happy. You know, how many people play it, get a game and play it eight times? But I found that games like this... In a couple weeks. ...will be played a lot, or Zularetto gets played a lot, too, just because, like I said at the beginning, they're quick to play. That is true. It is quick to play, so if you do bust it out, you're probably going to play it two or I three mean, times. I mean, this takes a half hour tops if people are slow. If people take their turn, you'll whip out a whole game, including scoring at the end, in like 20 minutes. The scoring could actually take as long as a whole age yeah (laughs) just because you know you have to add up so many different things and you know some of them are slightly now the analogy of the game is not as bad as Le Havre which basically doesn't have an actual theme just kind of like yeah boats and food get food it's a a port town yeah you make money but seven wonders you're playing a wonder slash the civilization that built that one? Yeah, day? it's like if you're playing, you know, the Colossus. Well, are you playing, are you the Colossus or are you the people building the Colossus? I think you're playing the city-state that has wrought the Colossus. Uh-huh. But, but you know, everyone plays a wonder. So and Sardia? You can either pick them <laughs> or pass them out randomly, and everyone has a little card. And in addition to the cards in their hands that they're buying and passing back and forth, you can also buy the improvements that make your wonder bigger. Like yes, as you complete your wonder, it does stuff. Yes. And every wonder has a different set of powers and an A and a B side. Yeah, so basically everyone has a wonder, which is basically three unique cards that no one else has, effectively, right? It's like everyone's playing with the same deck of cards, but each person has three cards, usually three, sometimes four. I think there's one weird co- one weird wonder that is four. But everyone basically has a handful of a, a few cards that are different from everyone else's cards that makes you unique, which gives you a little bit more replay value. It's like, well, I'll play with the mausoleum. Well, now I'll play with the hanging garden. So it's a little slightly different game uh, if you have a different wonder. And every wonder has two sides, which gives you a little bit more replay value because there's an A side, which is easy and direct, and there's a B side, which is a little more complicated but potentially higher payout. I would recommend when you play, do the random allocation of the wonders, but I, let players pick A or B. I would recommend you do it completely randomly. Nah, that gets boring because I'm already bored with the game. I mean, <laughs> I wouldn't play it unless I was teaching it or playing it with new people or as like a warm-up game at a board game night. I yeah, wouldn't just play it. It's definitely a good warm-up game. Yeah. I, I don't know. I wouldn't make the highlight game, though. No. But it is, a, it is an excellent new warm-up game, you know, and if I was short on warm-up games, I would definitely add it to my game library, even if I was bored I'm with it. I'm accumulating a lot of warm-up games because I like them, I realized that And I, because people refuse to play the series games, people just play warm-up games and then they're done. Well, I particular, I only owned some of the big heavy hitter games like El Grande and T&E, 
and I own a lot of the weird old out of print games like La Cheetah. Mm-hmm. I didn't own many quick whip em out games. Yep, this- That's why I got Zularetto and Seven Wonders, and I'm ordering Rico. Zularetto takes a little bit longer than Seven Wonders. I think it's more of a, a mid. It's sort of in between warm up and I say, well, highlight. There's different. There's two kinds of warm up games in my mind. There's the warm up game that's quick to play, as in you whip it out, you play it with everybody, and then you play the main event. And then there's the warm up game like Zularetto, where you've got a bunch of people over. You're gonna play a game. You're gonna play games, many games, but. People are still wanting to socialize. They're not in the let's just play a game mode yet. Zularetto, you can socialize over without impacting the game. I mostly think of Zularetto as more like a Settlers replacement, right? Because it's like I'm looking down on Settlers, but Zularetto I can still play a lot more easily than I can play Catan. Uh, Settlers and Zularetto are actually pretty equal to me. Zularetto's a much better uh, gateway, I think, too. Uh, I don't know. It depends on the person. Someone who is predisposed toward hardcore, Settlers is a better like intro game. Someone who isn't, Zularetto is a better intro game. Anyway. But yeah, Seven Wonders is my other, new hotness. My other trouble, I'll warn you now, when you're teaching this game, people who played Magic as they were kids, they'll get the resources immediately. No one else will. Yeah, Almost I was, everyone I was we have very taught surprised. this game to has fucked up the resources Despite multiple I was alternative explanations, analogies, examples, nothing works. I can't understand why these people don't understand how the resources work. It's like you have two rocks. That means you look at the cost of something. If it costs three rock, you can't afford it. It's like money that you can only you spend it once per turn, and every turn everyone gives you all the money back. Yes, it's magic resources. You tap them every round. But people don't get that, and they'll like they'll buy resources by trying to like play cards and just they will cock that up. You've got to make sure after you teach the whole game, teach everybody resources again. I guarantee at least one of your players doesn't actually understand. Yeah, and on top of that, right, even if people uh, understand resources, right, there's a lot of, the game requires you to notice a lot of small things on the cards. For example, you know, the you, you this card upgrades to that card for free. Well, it's a really tiny icon that says that. So if you're not really looking closely at every card, you might, like, say, not build something, even though you could have for free. Uh, you know, because... Uh, yep. People will also fuck up. They will not remember that they can't build the same named building twice. So they'll build the barracks, and then they'll build the barracks again, and it just cocks up the game. Mm. Anyway. Other than that, the game is great. Uh, I don't know if it was really worth MSRP, but I'm glad I own it. Mm-hmm. Am I doing more show, or is that enough? I think that's enough. This has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music.